I pray that is your heart's desire this morning as we have gathered here together is that you just want to know Jesus in a deeper way and experience him more. Uh, If you have your Bibles, grab them and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3, where we were at for our scripture meditation, Ephesians chapter 3, as we continue to walk through the word together. We've been looking at the book of Ephesians as a faith family, so if you're visiting with us this morning, uh, I just want to encourage you to grab a Bible and follow along. Uh, This is the primary way we work our way through the Word of God, is just looking at it verse by verse, and we believe that's the best way uh, to get the whole counsel of God. If you're looking around and you feel like, you know, where are, where, where are some people at? Well, this is the, this is the year or the, the time of year where we have a, a large group go camping every single year. Uh, so there's about 20 to 30 of our church family who's down in Burnsville at the campground. So if you're looking around, you're going, where's so-and-so? Well, a lot of them are there. Uh, Steve and Tracy Browning are on vacation this week, so they're at the beach. All right, so both of our secretaries are out of town for the whole week. Uh, my wife will be filling in in the office, so if you need something, the office will still be open. Um, but you can just pray for those who are not with us. Uh, we obviously miss them when they're not here, but everybody needs some time away, so we understand that. And, uh, it just happens that a large enough group of them fall at the same time, uh, same day here for us as a faith family. So let's, um, let's do this. Uh, let's have a word of prayer, and we will look at the Word of God together. Our gracious Heavenly Father, it is so good to be in your house. Lord, just to to gather together with my brothers and sisters and to fellowship with one another, to pray together, to sing together, to lift our voices to to the only one who is worthy of honor and glory and praise. (laughs) We can say truly this morning, our weary hearts find all they need in you, Lord. And we do want to know you more. And we don't deserve it. We don't deserve to know you at all. Lord, our hearts are sinful and desperately wicked. And yet, in love and grace, in your mercy, you have allowed us the privilege of of fellowship with you through your Son, who gave his life through the precious blood that we might stand before you justified. That we might come before your throne this morning and gather in your presence. And Lord, there's many needs here. There's heartache and there's hurt and there's cares and concerns and there's sickness and there's pain. And Lord, there's sin and rebellion. But Lord, our greatest need this morning is you. We need you. We need your word. We need your spirit. Father, I pray that you would be at work in this place. I know I'm nothing but an unworthy servant, but I pray that you would take this time and use it for your glory. Lord, as we, we bow our hearts and come humbly before you now, we ask that the gospel of Jesus Christ would go forth in power, not only in this place, but all around the world in this Lord's day. As your church is gathered together, We pray that your kingdom would advance and you would strengthen your people and sanctify them for your work. May you strengthen them through your spirit to accomplish your purpose for your glory. We ask it in the name of Jesus, our Lord, and amen. Well, as we are working our way through, uh, we see uh, just a shift here in chapter 3. The first two chapters have been primarily information, right? Paul's communicating to us the the beauty and the glory of the gospel and and the work of God on our behalf to rescue us and to save us. But now at the end of chapter 3, after all that truth is poured, poured out, the Apostle Paul just says, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Now remember, right? Paul's desire for these people is that they would they would walk in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Right? He he wants them to, to to be pleasing to the Lord in their life, but he understands that this is a people who are experiencing extreme persecution. So along with his desire they walk worthy, his heart is that they would stand strong in the face of that persecution and they would fight the good fight of faith. Remember last week he was concerned that they might lose heart. And so he's, he's, he's saying, don't lose heart. We're, we're going to draw near 
to the Lord. And that's what he's going to do here at the end of chapter 3 is he is just moved to pray, right? And, and you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating to me when, when Paul thinks about how he's going to equip the church for the battle. This is his first instinct. <laughs> he, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't call the church together. He doesn't get the elders together for a strategic planning meeting. He doesn't, he doesn't send out surveys and try and kind of gather, well, what do you think we should do and what do you think we should do? Right? <laughs> he doesn't invite the churches to Rome so they can have a conference, right? and, and a, a, you know, a church growth and development conference. He doesn't do any of that. What does he do? He prays. He prays. He prays for the church. And I want to remind you this morning that every great movement of God has begun with prayer. Every revival, every spiritual awakening throughout the history of the church was spearheaded by seeking the face of God. Now this is something that's on your heart as a church. I know that because last Sunday night as we gathered together, it came up. He said, we need to pray together more as a church. And so we have groups that are now saying, hey, we're going to meet and we're going to pray. Some of you met this morning to pray for this service up front, 915. They said, anybody who wants to come and pray for the service, you come, we're going to pray. There were others who said, you know, we're going to meet tonight at 530. We're going to pray. We're going to pray for the church. We're going to pray for the gospel to advance. And, and, And I believe God has burdened your heart for that because we need it. We want to be a people who pray. It it, it must be. It must be the priority of the church to pray. Now, I want you to see that this morning as we look at the Word. This is Paul's, when he thinks about the church, he's always moved to pray. (laughs) This is not the first time in his letter that he's already burst forth in prayer. Go back to chapter 1. Look at verse 17. Let me jump back to verse 16. I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. So he's praying for enlightenment in chapter 1, that they'll know, that they'll see all of the riches and the resources that they have in Christ. But here, in chapter 3, he's going to pray for enablement. Right? He's going to pray that, that, that the very power of God would be manifest in their life. And then when you jump over to chapter 6, just notice verse 18 of chapter 6 in this book. He says, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication to the end, Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Now, he calls for enlightenment and then enablement, and then he calls for involvement, right? He invites the people of God to pray with him for the work of God, for the glory of God, for the saints of God. And we learn a good deal about prayer from the Apostle Paul. We could say, right, we want to pray like Paul. And and so we want to do that this morning. We're just going to look... We're going to actually look at this prayer in three aspects. So we're going to look at it this morning and just see the priority of prayer, the nature of prayer. We're going to come back next week and we're going to look at this prayer and we're going to see the pattern of prayer. What is it that Paul is praying for? And then ultimately, we'll close out the chapter with the why. Why is prayer so important, so vital for the church? Let me ask you this this morning. How, How often do you pray for the church? Now, I know we start talking about prayer, and immediately <laughs> some of you just feel guilty. Right? Like, I know I don't pray like I should. My, my heart and my desire this morning is not to guilt you into anything. Right? As the people of God, we have the privilege of prayer. We get to pray. And I'm going to be the first to acknowledge that I don't have this thing down altogether. Right? I, I don't pray as I ought to, and I need to learn to pray. But. We do need to think carefully about our prayer life this morning. And not just personally, but how am I praying for the church, right? God's church, his 
people, not just this local body, yes, this local body, but his church, the universal church. How often do we pray, and, and what do you pray for the church? What is the nature of your prayer? Many times it's, well, God bless, right? God bless the pastor. God bless Grace Gospel. God bless your church. Well, that's good, but it's not very specific. <laughs> right, we're going to see some very specific things that we can pray for the church. In fact, I want to invite you to, with me, memorize this section of the book of Ephesians. All right, this, it's, this, it's this passage that drew my heart to, to, to come and walk through the book of Ephesians. So I want to invite you, just with me, you know, let's take... Let's take this, you know, these next three weeks and let's memorize. You could do that, right? Verses 14 through 21. Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. You could, you could memorize that or get a real good handle on it. All right, so that's my, that's my invitation to you as we look at Paul's prayer for the church in Ephesians 3. So, what do we learn? What do we learn about prayer? Well, let's look here first of all in verse 14. He just says, for this reason. For this reason. Why is Paul praying? Well, it's pointing us back, right? And it's pointing us back all the way back to chapters 1 and 2. He had this kind of parenthesis last week. So the, the entire first half of chapter 3 was his, you know, I'm concerned for you. I don't want you to lose heart. But now when he says, for this reason, he's pointing us back to the rich salvation that we have in Christ. Because, because you have been chosen, because you have been adopted, because you have been purchased by the blood of Christ, right? out, of the, out of the depths of your depravity, right? We saw that at the beginning of chapter 2, dead in our trespasses and sin, right? Out of, the, out of our sinfulness, out of our wickedness, because of God's great love and mercy with which he loved us, right? so he sent his son, Christ died for our sin, and God granted us, gifted us grace to believe. By grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. So we have this great, glorious salvation that tears down the wall of separation and, and forms this one new man. Right? Jew and Gentile alike have been brought together into the church. Right? And we saw those powerful pictures, right? New kingdom, new family, new temple. And, and so this is what Paul's saying. For this reason, because of this new, new people, I bow my knees before the Father. I'm praying for the church because it is the dwelling place of God. It is the way in which God manifests his wisdom and makes his glory known. It's for this purpose that Paul is now praying. And, and it's from that that I want, to, I want to pull out this first point of prayer. The pillar of prayer. Now, the pillar of prayer, and what I, what, I, what I mean by this is Paul is looking at all of this truth that we just kind of recounted. And he's basing his prayer on the truth of the Word of God. Right? That's his pattern here, right? He just un, unpacks truth in chapter 1, and then he prays. And then he unpacks truth in chapter 2, and then he prays. And he's going to do the same thing, and then he's going to finish in chapter 6. So what Paul is doing, the pillar of his prayer is the revealed Word of God. So let the Word of God, the truth of God, drive your prayers. So often what drives our prayer is what? It's want. It's desire. It's like, Lord, I want this. I need this. And so our circumstances and our situations is what drives our prayer. And what Paul was saying, that's not nearly as important as the truth of Scripture and the nature of God. Let that drive your prayer life. Let that be the pillar of your prayer life. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't take our needs, right? We do take our needs to the Lord. Right? Cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Right? He, he wants to hear from you. But as we come to him in prayer, the, the pattern that we see from Paul is, let's let the word of God and the truth of God drive our prayers. Right? So that's important here. Right? The pillar of prayer is biblical truth. And then secondly, right, he says, so for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. Now, the second thing we see is the position of prayer. 
when the Apostle Paul prays, who does he pray to? The Father. This is an important aspect of prayer that, that we have talked about over the years. But listen, it's vital. It's, it's, it's so important that if this is not true for you, then you can't pray. Now, you can, you can speak into the air all you want. But for you to pray, God must be your Father. Right? Prayer is relational. Right? So Paul bows his knees, but he bows his knees to the Father. We do not pray to some impersonal force or some far-off deity. We call upon our heavenly Father. Yeah, you know, nearly everybody prays, but not everybody prays to the Father. And that's, that's the key to prayer, is it not? This is the way in which the Lord Jesus Christ has has modeled for us to pray our father which art in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done we start with that essential relationship now, i'm not asking you what you know about god or what you know about christ i'm asking you this morning are you a child of god do you have a relationship with him through jesus christ that's where prayer begins yeah. my children know they can come to me when they have a need. They know that. Not only do they know that they can come to me when they have a need, but they, they know that they can, they can ask me, right? That they can come and they can make their request. Now, if that's right, right? And, and, and we want that, right? As parents, you want that. If, I mean, if I'm out, if I'm out at, the, at the mall, we were out thursday for emma's birthday if we were you know we were out shopping and and this strange kid walks up to me and says hey would you buy me that where's your parents right that's not mine they don't belong to me but if you know if, if my child comes up to me and says daddy you know can i have that i might not always say yes right? they know that <laughs> but they can make that request because they have the relationship to make the request. Does that make sense? You must know God as your father if you're going to request, if you're going to, if you're going to come to him and pray to him. Otherwise, right, he say, I, I don't know you. Who are you? Right? <laughs> so how do we know God as father? Listen to John chapter 1, verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. How do you become a child of God? You believe on Jesus Christ. You receive him as Savior and Lord. That's how you become a child of God. You embrace the Son of God who died in your place for your sin. You say, yes, I have sinned. I believe that Jesus died for me. I embrace him as Lord. And when you do that, God brings you into his family. And it's just, you know, he adopts you as one of his own with all the rights and privileges of his child. And here's the thing that I didn't understand until I became a parent. See, not only do my children know that they can come to me, but I want them to. I want them to. I want to hear from my children. I look forward to talking to my children. Right? There are... You know, I shared this before, right? When, when they were little, I still have a couple little ones, but when they were little, I would come home and, Daddy! Right? And they would just run and they would grab a hold of me and they would just tell me all about what was going on. Now, my little ones, they, they tend to do that still. But as they get older, you know what? I walk in the house and it's crickets. <laughs> They're all off in their own separate places, doing their own thing. And they don't even know. I can walk through the whole house, and they don't even know that Daddy's home. <laughs> but there are those moments where they will sit down, and they'll tell me what's going on, and they'll tell me what's happening. And I cherish those moments. Now, the only reason I tell you that is because it's something that has helped me understand prayer a great deal better. God the Father wants to hear from you. He delights in hearing 
from you. I don't think we often think about that. We, <laughs> well, I don't want to bother God with that. I don't, I, you know, I don't. God wants to hear from you. The way that a, the way that a parent longs to, 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 to fellowship with their children is the way God wants to fellowship with you. Right? So, so understand the position of prayer. It's a relational, it's, a, it's, it's, it's relational in nature. But then also notice this, prayer is familial, right? It, it, what I mean is there's a family nature to prayer. It's, there's a partnership that we see here. He says Paul is praying to the Father, but he says to the Father from whom every family in heaven and earth is named. Right, so not only is God my Father, but if you're here this morning and you know Jesus Christ, he is your Father. And Our brothers and sisters in Africa and in Asia and in Europe and in South America. And every family on earth is named from the Father. We have the same Father. We're the same family. And so Paul now is pointing out that as we pray, there's a corporate nature to prayer that we don't want to lose sight of. Notice down in verse 18. We're not going to quite get there this morning, but he says that they may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. Strength to comprehend with who? With all the saints. Paul's prayer is for the whole church, the whole body from whom every family on heaven and earth is named. Right. So Paul's heart here is moved for the church. So we don't want to miss that this morning. Prayer is positional in that we have a relationship to the Father, but then it's also there's a partnership that exists within the family of God in which we now pray for one another. And, and, and we do that in different ways, right? We certainly pray for, for our needs, right? Physical needs, spiritual needs, emotional needs. We do that really on Wednesday night together as a church family. We gather together and you have the opportunity just to share with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Here's what's going on. And they can hear from you your request and pray for you. But what I want you to see this morning is that Paul's priority in prayer is not, not the physical. It's not. Paul's priority in prayer here is the spiritual nature. Right? He always, always, right? He in chapter 1, prayed for enlightenment. Chapter 2, now enablement. Right? He's praying that the church would be empowered by God. Why? Because, because it's through the church that God is making His glory known. And so, I'm not saying we shouldn't pray for those physical things, because we should. We should, pray for, you know, we should pray for sickness and, and healing and ailments of every kind. But our priority in prayer and I think sometimes we miss this. And we want to learn from Paul. You, let me just read it, because so we're going to look at it in detail next week. But let me read it to you. Right. You hear the, the heart of Paul here. For the church, that according to, verse 16, the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Does that sound like your prayers? Mine either, not very often. Let's learn from Paul here how to pray. How to pray for his people. So often we pray for the situations and circumstances when what we need to be praying is for God's enablement, God's enlightenment, God's empowerment for his people through his spirit. So we see that. Now the the next thing we see is what I would call the posture of prayer in verse 15 and 16. He says this, I bow my knees. Now that's instructive for us. The proper Posture of prayer is demonstrated by Paul. And what I mean is this. Right? I'm not talking about whether you're kneeling on the ground or whether you're standing up. When Paul says, I bow my knees, it's expressing an attitude of heart. 
the way in which you approach your heavenly father matters. So to bow before the father is to humble yourself before him. To, to kneel, the way the Apostle Paul is expressing it here, right? it's an attitude of submission. God, I want what you want. I'm bowing to your will, to your desires. I don't, I don't even know what I need and what I want. But God, you know what's best for me. So there's just this, this spirit of submission and humility that is expressed in the way in which the Apostle Paul approaches God. I, I bow my knees. You know, what's the right way to pray? You know, again, let me, maybe you've heard this before. It's called the, the Prayer of Cyrus Brown. All right. It's a poem that was written back in the 1800s. You listen. The proper way for a man to pray, said Deacon Lemuel Keyes, and the only proper attitude is down upon his knees. No, I should say the way to pray, said Reverend Dr. Wise, is standing straight with outstretched arms and wrapped in upturned eyes. Oh, no, 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 said Elder Slow. Such posture is too proud. A man should pray with eyes fast closed and head contritely bowed. Seems to me his hand should be austerely clasped in front with both thumbs pointing toward the ground, said Reverend Dr. Blunt. Last year I fell in Hodgkin's well, head first, said Cyrus Brown, with both my heels a sticking up, my head a pointing down. And I made a prayer right then and there, best prayer I ever said, the prayingest prayer I ever prayed, a standing on my head. <laughs> Doesn't really matter so much, right? How, you know, your posture is, the posture of your heart is what matters. And, and, and you know, we see there in that little poem, just a, not only the humility and the submission that we talked about, but also an expression of utter helplessness and dependence and we don't want to miss that it, <laughs> yeah as the apostle paul is praying notice verse 16 he says according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so as paul's praying and he's praying for the church he prays they may be strengthened with power now, to pray that they would be strengthened and to pray for power for them signifies that what? That they are weak. They're weak. They, we come to God in prayer and we pray to him because we are needy. We are helpless. And we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ because apart from him, we can do nothing. Now, that is, right? Right? Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, blessed are the poor in spirit. This is, is a vital understanding of our nature. So Paul's praying, and he's praying that these people may be strengthened with power through his spirit. And it's very clear here, the power to accomplish what Paul is praying can never come from us. Never. It, it happens in us. But it's through his spirit. So as Paul's praying, that they would be strengthened in their inner being. But there's not something welling up inside of them that, not this internal motivation or this can-do spirit. It's the very spirit of God at work in the people of God. God strengthen them through your spirit. Now, we want to talk about what that means for us next week a little bit. But for this morning, I want you to understand that if we're going to be a praying people, then we need to be a desperate people, a needy people. We approach the, the throne of our Heavenly Father on our knees, confessing, God, I can't do this. I can't be what you've called me to be. And the moment we lose that desperation, self-reliance creeps in. Right? We tend to, to begin to, to walk with pride. Like, I can handle this. I can do this. And then prayer becomes what? It becomes our, our last resort. 
When everything else fails, then I pray. Well, that's not what we see from Paul here, is it? Not when everything else fails, but this is the priority. Right? This, is what, this is what the people of God do first. Because they recognize that without him, without his help, without his strength, we can do nothing. That goes against every fiber of our American mindset, doesn't it? It does. I know. I live here. Right? There's this kind of can-do spirit. This, you know, we don't want anybody's help. We don't need anybody's help. I can do everything on my own. And I can fix these problems. And I can balance all these balls. And you can't. Not spiritually. Spiritually, if we're going to live the life that God has called us to live in a manner worthy of the gospel, and we're going to stand strong and fight this fight of faith, then we need to desperately go before him. Acknowledging our weakness and our need of his help and his strength. So the posture of prayer is one of humility, one of submission, one of dependence. This is what we see expressed through the Lord's Prayer, right? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right? I want what you want, Lord. But then give us this day our daily bread. I need you to survive. I need you to live. Forgive us our sins, our debts, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. If I'm going to walk in a right relationship with you, I, I'm, 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 if we're honest this morning, we are a sinful people. And we, moment by moment, day by day, day by day, we need his forgiveness. Help me to stand against the temptations of the evil one. We have an enemy who's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And in our weakness, we cannot fight this fight of faith. In chapter 6, he's going to say, be strong. Be strong, brothers. Be strong. But he's not going to say, he's going to say what? Be strong in the Lord. Our strength comes from him. And the Apostle Paul is showing us here this morning that that strength is rooted in a dependence on God. As we seek him. As we call upon his name. And here's the good news. We're going to finish here. The Apostle Paul is going to express that the inexhaustible resources that we have as a people of God in prayer. So look at verse 16. Right, he's praying they would be strengthened through his spirit and the inner man that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you. According to the riches of his glory. The last thing I want you to see this morning is the potential of prayer. This is an incredible thought. The reservoir of his glory. Let me ask you this morning. According to the riches of his glory. When do we get to the end of that? When do we exhaust his glory and his riches? You can't. Right? Thank you from upstairs. <laughs> the Apostle Paul says, Philippians 4, right? My God will supply all your need according to His riches in Christ Jesus. Now that's good news for us this morning. Because we're a needy people. Right? We're a desperate people. And yet we have a God who has inexhaustible resources for us. My God will supply every need. Philippians 4.19, according to his riches. You see the, the potential here of prayer? You have a need? We have a God who is able to meet that need. Now, that doesn't mean that he always meets the need the way we think he should meet the need. And that's how often we, we often approach prayer that way, right? God, do this. Fix this. And sometimes, in, through God's inexhaustible resources, could he fix that? 
Yes, but he doesn't fix that. What he does is he, he fixes us. <laughs> right? He does a work in our heart, in our life. He strengthens us. He sustains us in the midst of the storm. <laughs> Sometimes he calms the storm. <laughs> Sometimes he calms his child. Right? And, and so, notice down in verse 20. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. <laughs> Not only can God do what we ask, he can do more <laughs> than what we ask. According to what? The power at work in us. Where does that power come from? Come from him. Right, this is what Paul's praying for. They'll be strengthened through his spirit. One more verse here, James 5. James 5, chapter 5, verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. That's incredible, isn't it? The prayer of a righteous man is, is powerful, is effective. And, and, and what James does is he just equates us. Right? He says, Elijah is no different than we are. And Elijah prayed that it wouldn't rain for three and a half years. It didn't rain. <laughs> and then he prayed that it would rain. Now, he did this at God's, you know, this was according to God's will, God's plan. So we want to keep that in mind, right? Go back to the very beginning, the pillar of, right? We're going to pray according to God's truth. Right? But we have great power available to us as the people of God. Now, here's the question. If we have such power, such potential at our disposal, then why on earth are we not praying more? And I'm not just talking to you, right? We need to be a people of prayer. <laughs> I believe with all my heart this is one of the greatest needs that we have as a church. And I believe it's one of the greatest needs of the church. And I think that's what we see here from the Apostle Paul. Again and again, Paul bursts forth in prayer for the church. What's he praying for? He's praying for a needy people, a desperate people, to call upon the Father that he might accomplish his purpose through us. So over the next two weeks, that's what we're going to see. We're going to see the what and the why of Paul's prayer here. Right? The pattern of prayer, the power of prayer. My one concern as we close this message out this morning is this. That you might be here and you feel like you simply cannot pray. Right? Maybe you feel guilty this morning. No, I don't. I know I don't pray. Well, you're in good company, right? None of us pray like we should. But there are some of you here because of Maybe you're a Christian, maybe you, maybe you know Jesus Christ, but because of sin in your life that is unconfessed and you have been unwilling to repent of it, you simply cannot call on God. Your fellowship with him is broken, and you know it, and you feel so far from him, and this morning you're just, you have this feeling as if there's absolutely, it's a hopeless situation. It's not hopeless. Let me just remind you of what we're told. 1 John 1, verse 9. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. If you would turn away from your sin this morning and you would confess your sin, he will forgive you. That fellowship will be restored and that pathway of prayer will be re renewed. And for some of you, that's what you need. And there are others here in this place it's not that there's some sin in your life that needs confessed. It's that you don't know God as your father at all. 
You don't have that relationship. And so maybe you do pray. You know, I, this is, I talk to unbelievers all the time. He's like, oh, I pray every day. Well, who are you praying to? If you don't know God as your father, some of you have grown up in church. You know this gospel inside and out. But what we're going to see is there's, there's a lot more than a head knowledge at play. This is a very real relationship with the God of the universe. And if you don't have, if you don't know him as your father, that's your greatest need today. Is to humbly bow your knee before the God of the universe. Turn away from your sin and trust in Jesus Christ. That's what you need. You need to be saved. You need to know God in this way. And when that happens, (laughs) when you call on him, he will bring you into his family. And you can call him your father. And you can go to him with your deepest needs. And we have a father who knows how to give good gifts to his children. Isn't that what Jesus said? If you, if you, being earthly, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more does our heavenly father? Oh, brothers and sisters, we have a good father. He knows exactly what we need. And we need to call on his name. And that's how we're going to close this morning. Right? We're going to close. I, I, I mean, what better way, right? than to pray. Some of you, this is what you need. So I want to encourage you to pray. Some of you need to get your heart right. right? So it's a time to confess, to repent, for sake of sin. Some of us need to pray with a purpose. Pray that God would do a work in our heart and our life. Pray that God would do a work in the heart and life of the church. So that's how we're going to close this morning, right? Just in the quietness of the moment. Now, before I close in prayer and before we pray together as a church family, I do want to just offer an invitation. If you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ and you are concerned for your salvation, I want to make myself available to you. I'll be in the back after the service. I would love to talk to you more about how you can enter into this relationship. Brothers and sisters, we have this great privilege of prayer. Let us make use of it now as we close.